Okay, I think uh, we can start. Uh, mm, a very warm uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's really a great uh, pleasure uh, to have here today Professor Ingrid Merting uh, from uh, Martin Luther University in Halle Wittenberg uh, that uh, will be uh, talking about uh, transversal transport coefficients and topological properties. Um, before uh, introducing uh, Professor Merting, uh, let me also remind uh, some of the next uh, Marvel events uh, that will take place uh, either as uh, distinguished lectures. So you see in the spring, uh, we'll have Sharon Glotzer, Alana Spurugudzik, and Garnet Chan. And uh, together with SECAM, uh, we'll have uh, uh, some classics in molecular and materials modeling already next week. Uh, uh, one on a fluid phase equilibria by Thanos Panagiotopoulos and Dominic Tildesley, uh, and in uh, January on uh, many body perturbation theory uh, with Lucia Reining, Steve Louis, and uh, Rex Gopi. Uh, but uh, to go back uh, to our speaker of today, uh, so Professor Merting got her uh, PhD in theoretical physics at the Technical University in Dresden, uh, where she was also an assistant professor. We were just chatting very interestingly. She spent uh, five years as a senior scientist at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in uh, Dubna. Um, some of you might know this. It's an uh, organization equivalent uh, to CERN. I think a lot of heavy isotopes also were uh, created there. And, uh, and uh, after that, uh, she had a number of visits and collaborations uh, uh, in uh, New York University with Professor Levy at Paris Sud uh, with Professor Fert of the Nobel Prize fame and uh, at the University of Nagoya with Professor Inoue. Uh, and uh, then she started in 2001 as a professor uh, where she is now at the Martin Luther University in Halle, Wittenberg, uh, continuing also some visits and collaboration. I think one that um, I feel is very dear to all of us in the communities with uh, Balas Gyofi at uh, Bristol University. Uh, she was an Heisenberg Fellow of the German Physical Society, a Fellow of the Japan Society for Promotion of Science, and a Max Planck uh, Fellow. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to hear her today uh, on her talk. Uh, Ingrid, please, the floor is all yours, and thanks again for uh, participating in this. We are very happy to have you here. So, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's my pleasure to present our results on topological properties and Hall effects or transversal transport properties and topological properties. And uh, let me start with a short overview. So after an introduction, I will talk about the topological Hall effect. I will talk about the anomalous Hall effect. And if I have enough time, I will also present some results on the magnetic spin Hall effect. So uh, transversal transport coefficients. So uh, everybody knows the Hall effect. And I present to you the Hall trio, which is the regular Hall effect that you know, which is caused by you have a system where you have a current in the system and an external magnetic field perpendicular. And as a consequence, so uh, you have the Lorentz force acting on the charge. And then you have a separation of positive and negative charges in your sample, which gives rise to a bias, the Hall bias. Already a few years later, Hall himself discovered the so-called anomalous Hall effect. In the anomalous Hall effect, you don't have an external magnetic field, but you have a ferromagnetic system. And in a ferromagnetic system, we don't have any more Gramma's degeneracy of the bands, which means twofold degenerate bands with respect to spin. The bands are exchange split, and you have an, a different number of spin up and spin up, uh, down electrons at the Fermi level. And uh, in this anomalous Hall effect, the electrons are separated by spin. And you will also observe a Hall bias like before, but with a totally different mechanism. And uh, it took many years until this mechanism was explained. So it was uh, more than 100 years later that the mechanism was explained. And then 
there was also the idea there must be something similar in a system where you have Kramer's degeneracy, so in a metallic system, where you have spin orbit interaction, no magnetization, where you have a separation of electrons with spin up and spin down in a system where you have an applied bias or a current, but you cannot measure a bias. There is no Hall bias, but instead there is a so-called spin current. And the spin current is really something special. You cannot measure it directly. You probably know there are no terminals that you can attach to your system that would record a spin current. So you need some idea how to measure it. But the spin current is a, a new option, how to transport, how to transport information in your system. So um, for the description of the effects that I discussed, there are, you can use a semi-classical equation of motion. And we have two of them. The regular one that you know from electrodynamics, change of momentum, electric, external electric field, Lorentz force. And then there is change of position where you have the first term, which is Ehrenfest the errand test uh, contribution. And uh, if you remember from old uh, quantum mechanics textbooks that when Ehrenfest was discussed, there was always a comment. This is only valid if you don't have interband transitions. And uh, since uh, something is missing in Ehrenfest, and this is described very recently by means of the so-called anomalous velocity. And the anomalous velocity is caused by a Berry curvature. And if you compare the two, two equations of motion, they have some similarity and analogy. And you see that change of momentum, change of position, change of position, change of momentum. And here you have this magnetic field in real space and here, instead, you have the Berry curvature, which is something like a magnetic field in K-space. This is, of course, uh, not a field that you can measure. It's not an observable. It's kind of a Hilfsfeld. I use the German word since I don't know uh, an English expression that uh, can describe uh, this effect very well. So um, I will concentrate to this term. And if you have either uh, the Lorentz force or this Berry curvature term, you get in your transport coefficients, the transversal components. This means this is Ohm's law, linear response, Ohm's law, but uh, the conductivity is a tensor and you have the longitudinal elements and these are the whole elements, the transversal coefficients. And this happens in all transport coefficients that you can consider. And now let me come to an expression of the anomalous hole conductivity. If you want to calculate the anomalous hole conductivity, it's like an integral over all occupied states. Uh, and the integrand is the Berry curvature. And then you have the sum over all bands, but you can also discuss it individually for each band. You have a contribution of each band to this conductivity. This is surprising since usually what you know from transport, you know that uh, only the electrons at the Fermi level contribute to the transport coefficients. But here, the whole Fermi C is involved in this uh, property of the anomalous hole conductivity. If you want to know what, how the Berry curvature looks like, then it's the following, following expression. So the Berry curvature is something like uh, a correction, a second order uh, perturbation theory correction. This expression you know from second order perturbation theory. And the operators in are the velocity operators. And these are 
flux states. But it's important that the Berry curvature is a property of a certain band of the band N, but this property is determined by all other bands M. So you see that the sum goes over all other bands, but, but N. And this, with this, I come back to my comment in the beginning that uh, Ehrenfest is only valid if you don't have interband transitions. So this Berry curvature describes somehow the interband transitions by means of a replacement, by means of, of this field. And you see that the Berry curvature is going to be particularly large if two bands are nearby. So the lower the, uh, so the lower the distance between the bands, the lower is this uh, difference. So and now there is a, the other property. I said there is this anomalous Hall effect, but if you go to a non-magnetic material, you can also consider the spin hall conductivity. The spin hall conductivity is now a three by three tensor. So you have 27, L, uh, three by three by three tensor, third rank. So you have 27 elements. So each spin direction, which is given here, has a tensor like the conductivity tensor before. And the difference, if you analyze the mathematical expressions, is just that you do not consider any more the Berry curvature as introduced before. It's now the so-called spin Berry curvature. And you see, there are two different operators. Before, I had the velocity operator here as well. It's now the spin current operator that enters the spin Berry curvature. And so I also get the third index. OK. Now I want to uh, give you a simplified expression, which is good for understanding and discussion. It's the so-called two current model. So of course, all the effects, this Berry curvature description is related to spin orbit interaction. If you want so, you can say, if you would do a fully quantum mechanical description, the origin of all the effects is spin orbit interaction. And in this semi-classical picture, spin orbit interaction is somehow replaced by the Berry curvature. And um, if you would, if you have spin orbit interaction, you know that you never have a fully polarized system, that all the states have a certain spin character, a mixed spin character, but you can nevertheless consider a two current model with spin up and spin down. And uh, then the two effects are very simple. Then the anomalous Hall effect is the sum of the two contributions from spin up and spin down. And the spin hall effect is exactly the difference. And now let me consider uh, this a little more in detail. So uh, I calculate the spin projected uh, contributions as discussed before. And I consider a system, a metal, where my Fermi level is within the band. So, uh, the contribution to the Brillouin zone integral are the gray states here up to the Fermi energy. And this is this Fermi circle. This gives rise to, uh, to calculate the conductivity tensor. And then if I look at uh, a real calculation and ask myself, uh, where is the uh, is this conductivity contribution large? Then I get the following picture. Let's start with gold on the right hand side. You see, this is the band structure. You are familiar with this, and this is the spin hall conductivity, which would be the difference of the two. And the spin hall conductivity, um, it's as I said before, the one of the transversal coefficients of the conductivity tensor. And it can have positive or negative sign, can change sign as a function of energy. 
So it's here represented as a function of energy. And uh, you see that I get particularly large contributions like here, if two bands are nearby, if I have what we call avoided crossing in the bands. But nevertheless, at the Fermi level, most of the contributions are compensated and the, and the value itself is small. Now, if I go to platinum, then I see, I calculate another integer number for the, uh, another real number for the spin hole conductivity as for gold, but it's much larger in units of, of uh, H square over E. It's much larger. And you see, it's also clear, we know that uh, platinum is a transition metal and uh, we have the D bands at the Fermi level. We have very many avoided crossings also at the Fermi level. So we get really a very large value at, uh, for the spin hole conductivity of platinum. And this is also already manifested by all the experiments the experimentalists like platinum for, for these measurements, since it's a very robust material with a large spin hole effect. And it's not, so this contribution is very high in comparison to extrinsic contributions. And so you have a stable, uh, a material with stable results. Now I come to the topological states. I said now, with, if the Fermi level is within uh, the band, I observe for the spin hole conductivity real, real numbers. Now, if the Fermi level is in the gap, then I integrate over the fully occupied band. And as a result, I observe an integer number. And this integer number multiplied with the conductance quantum is then the conductivity. This integer number, we know that already from uh, before, can be zero if we have a topological trivial insulator, or it can be an integer number different from zero for topological for a germ insulator, let's say so. And if I have the case of a germ insulator, then I show you a picture from a topological insulator, but the germ insulator would not have a Gramas degeneracy. But what I want to say is similar. So you see that it's an insulator. You have the valence band, you have the conduction band, and in the gap, you have the edge states bridging the gap. And the churn number would give you uh, the number of edge states of one spin direction if you would have a churn insulator. For this set two topological insulator, you have to calculate the set two uh, topological invariant. Okay, but the most important thing that what I want to tell you is now my conductivity has integer values, you measure a conductivity with integer values of the conductance quantum. And this leads to the Hall effects that you know to the quantum versions of the Hall effects. So this is the origin of the quantum Hall effect, the quantum spin Hall effect, and the quantum anomalous Hall effect. The principal physics that I described above is the same. The only difference is that you are not in a band with your Fermi level, but that you are in a gap and that only the edge states, which are quantized, contribute to the conductance. And so for the quantum Hall effect, you see you have again this external magnetic field. And now since this external magnetic field acts with the Lorentz force on the charge of the electrons, the two electrons, with opposite spin move in the same direction and contribute to the conductance. For the quantum spin Hall effect, on the other hand, as I said before, the Barry curvature is the origin. 
and acts on the spin. And now the two electrons with opposite spin, they move in opposite direction. And now they cause a spin current. And for the quantum anomalous Hall effect, this is the case again, where you have a ferromagnetic material, where the Gramos degeneracy of the bands is lifted. So you have a, a single band either spin up or spin down. And then also uh, an edge state, a single edge state. And this uh, electron is contributing to the anomalous, to the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So this is first my overview of the Hall effects that you are probably familiar with. Now I come to another top Hall effect the so-called topological Hall effect. And the topological Hall effect, so I have done this work in collaboration with Berge Goebel, Alexander Mock, and Jürgen Henk. And uh, we did quite some papers on this subject. And um, what is the system under consideration? So for the topological Hall effect, uh, we have a system with the chiral spin texture in contact to a two-dimensional electron gas. Then, as before, you apply an electric field or you send a current through your sample. And as a response, you observe a charge current perpendicular or a spin current also perpendicular. In case of a charge current, you would also be able to measure the whole bias. Now, the chiral spin texture is of interest for us. The chiral spin texture are skirmions. And here I show you the experimental observation of skirmions. This is a, a picture, a Lorenz uh, microscopy picture of the group of Tokura. And uh, this is the, our view of skirmions, so theoreticians' view of skirmions. And this we consider a skirmion lattice. And um, this is a unit cell of this skirmion lattice. We consider a hexagonal lattice. And as each arrow that you, you see in my view graph is attached to an atomic position and has a certain magnetic moment. And the arrangement of magnetic moments forms the skirmion. We describe the system by this model Hamiltonian. The, the electron, the two-dimensional electron gas that I set attached to the skirmion uh, texture is described by kinetic energy. And this term is so-called Hans rule coupling term. So the spin of the electron uh, interacts with the underlying magnetic texture. So that means the electron is propagating through the system. And if it's slow enough, the electron would align or anti-align with the magnetic moment of the texture. Now, uh, if we look at the electron, we do dissolve the electronic structure. If we say that the coupling constant is zero, we would observe a band structure since we have so many atoms in the unit cell, the bands are highly degenerate. And then we increase the J or the M over, over T. M is the size of the magnetic moments, the length of the magnetic moments, and T is uh, the hopping uh, integral. So then you see we lift the degeneracies. And we have the blue color and the red color blue color tells you that the electron spin is aligned with the texture. And the red color would mean that the electron spin is opposite to the texture. And so we an, increase then uh, the M over T. And you see, we come to a limit. It's also called adiabatic limit, where the two subbands of the electrons aligned with the texture are totally separated from the subbands of the electrons uh, with, with opposite spin to the texture. 
But nevertheless, the two subband sets are very similar. And uh, for the rest, I just, they, they are very similar and all the results that I observe have just a negative, an opposite sign from, uh, for each of these subsets. So I concentrate in my considerations to the lower set of bands. So what we now do, we calculate uh, the whole conductivity as before. The only difference is now that's a two-dimensional system. So, and then there is also only the factor of two pi and here is not any more H uh, bar, but H. So everything is the same. This is the band structure, and this is the result for the whole conductivity. And you see, as before, uh, that you have negative and positive values, but in particular, I start here, you see that you have plateaus. You really have quantum, uh, you have plateaus like in the quantum Hall effect. Here you have a plateau as a jump of E square over H. If you go to the next, there is some, something in between, I will explain later. You have the next plateau, two e square over h. And then you have plateaus, but uh, the uh, perturbation in between is, uh, is larger than before. So you see certain plateaus. Here, if I go to the, uh, to the left, hand side of the conductivity to the negative contributions, you see a, a jump here of a plateau of two e square over h. So uh, what is the origin of this? And now I would like to show you that the topological Hall effect that we have calculated before is the same as the quantum Hall effect but for a non-collinear magnetic system. So I come back to my skirmion and you, saw, you know that the topological invariant of the skirmion is the so-called skirmion number. This is the way how you can calculate the skirmion number. It's a topological invariant similar to the term number. And this also uh, makes uh, the skirmion topologically protected and very stable as a magnetic will. But uh, you see, you, uh, hand in hand with the skirmion number, you can also analyze the so-called emergent field. You see the skirmion number depends on R. This is now in real space, uh, the unit cell. And now we analyze the skirmion number as a function of R. And you see, under the skirmion number, you see that, the, that we have the so-called emergent field. And this is, a magnet, this is a field. It's something like a magnetic field in real space, but not uh, a real ma external magnetic field. It's also a Berry curvature, but now in real space. And uh, it has positive and negative values and guarantees the uh, skirmion number, the topological invariant. So what we did to simplify our considerations, we homogenized this field, but kept the skirmion number unchanged. So the topological properties are still unchanged, but we homogenized the field. And now we do the following calculation. We don't have a calculation as before with the Hunt school coupling term. We now say we have this uh, field in real space, this Berry curvature field, in the emergent field in real space. And we take this uh, magnetic, this emergent field in real space in our Hamiltonian by Byers pile substitution as a vector potential. And for simplicity, we consider just free electrons, not electrons in a crystal potential. So what do we observe? So we have three electrons in a hexagonal lattice. And what we would get without uh, the emergent field, you know very well, also from graphene, it's this uh, dispersion relation here underneath. If I switch on my uh, vector potential or my emergent field, 
what I get is Landau quantization. These are the Landau levels. And now I want to relate the Landau levels to my result of the, and now I calculate for, for this uh, electronic structure, the anomalous hole conductivity as before. And what I observe is the following. So if I start again here, then you see jumps in E square over H. I start here jumps in two E square over H. So what does it mean? If we look to the uh, certain Landau levels in the prion zone, these are certain orbits that you get. And so you have uh, one Fermi uh, line in the Brion zone for one Landau level here for this case. And here where you have the steps of two E square over H, you have two orbits per Brion in the Brion zone. And then you have a certain jump exactly here, which is related to a Van Hofer singularity in your band structure. Now, to analyze it in terms of, of topological properties, we calculated the germ number of the bands, of the Landau levels. And you see the following. The Landau levels above, they have germ number minus one. And every time, uh, a churn number minus one comes to my system, I get a jump in the conductivity, as we have been seeing it. Quantum Hall effect and the quantum anomalous Hall effect and so on. So each time uh, a new Landau level enters, we get uh, the churn number is increasing, we get a jump in the conductivity. If we come from below, the jump is two, since also the churn number per Landau level is minus two. And here at the Van Hofer singularity, I have a very certain uh, orbit and we have with a very high churn number. So 24 minus one, I don't want to go into this details of this, but I want to compare these results of the uh, free electron gas with our results of the skirmion. This was the skirmion band structure, and this is the free electron band structure uh, with the field, with, the, with Landau quantization, and here with the hans coupling. Now, if uh, you see that I have a certain dispersion here, since I have a crystal potential in my system, which I don't have for the free electrons, but I have a correspondence, of the levels with respect to each other. If I compare the conductivity that I calculated, there's also exactly the same correspondence. The levels, uh, the jumps in the conductivity correspond to each other and it's related, either I call it a Landau level or a certain, uh, uh, is related to a certain band in my system. But, the next step is very interesting. Now I relate it not to the bands, but to the edge states. For this reason, I do now show you the surface band structure of the systems. So before I have always shown you the bike band structure with the Landau levels. I also have the bike band structure in for the Landau levels. So the surface band structure has still the sharp Landau levels. For my system with my skirmion system, of course, in the surface band structure, the bulk bands are projected onto the surface prion zone and form real bands with a certain width. But if I have a global gap between the bands, which is very uh, pronounced here between the first and the second, then you see in between, I have an edge state. And this edge state I have in my skirmion lattice and I have in uh, my uh, Landau level system with the emergent field. And this edge state causes the, conduct the quantized conductance or conductivity in my calculations and also in reality. And also here, this edge state is responsible for uh, this jump. 
And if I now, uh, I said in the beginning, there are little changes from the clear pronounced jump. You see from where the changes come from. As soon as my edge state hybridizes with the bike bend, I have not any more only the edge contribution, but I have also the bike contribution. And the bike contribution, as you remember, I said in the beginning is a real number. It's not quantized. And the bike contribution is always opposite to the uh, contribution of the edge state. So it's always the bike contribution reduce, reduces the clear plateau. And so uh, the same holds here. Let's go to the lower part of, of to the lower energies. You see these jumps of 2e square over h. Then you see clearly two edge states between the levels. And the same in my skernion lattice, there are two edge states. They are very nearby, but still you see it. There is a clear correspondence. So what I want to say as a conclusion of this part, that uh, the topological Hall effect is the same as a quantum Hall effect. We have been seeing it by mapping the two model systems on top of each other. And if I want to have some picture for the topological Hall effect, I see that I have, of course, a non-collinear magnetic system with the skernions underneath. And as a consequence, you have edge states with, a, let's say, a helical uh, spin texture. So the spin in this adiabatic limit is always going to align with the underlying uh, skernion uh, spin texture. And so we get this uh, edge states with a non-collinear spin texture. But otherwise, it's the same physics. Now, uh, this is my conclusion for this part. Anomalous velocity is the origin of transversal transport coefficients and spin and anomalous Hall effect and quantum spin and anom quantum anomalous Hall effect and topological Hall effect have the same origin. So and I have shown you that the topological Hall effect can be mapped onto the quantum Hall effect. <clears throat> I want to add something, uh, some little detail, which is very interesting. So anomalous Hall effect in coplanar antiferromagnets. This work was done in collaboration with Oliver Bush and with Birger Göbel again. And I first saw coplanar antiferromagnets are very popular at the moment. I tell you why. So coplanar antiferromagnets are, for example, systems iridium, uh, mangan three iridium. So we have three, man in the unit cell, we have three mangan, manganese atoms and one iridium atom, which comes from the corner here. And uh, the magnetic moments are oriented at an angle of 120 degree. And we don't, so they are non-collinear antiferromagnets. We don't have a resultant magnetic moment. And we have two types of these uh, non-collinear antiferromagnets, the ones that I discussed just now with an FCC, FCC lattice. And we consider the stacking along the 111 direction, which is ABC. And we also observe it for manganese 3, uh, gallium, germanium, or tin, and uh, in a hexagonal structure. And we have <coughs> ABA stacking. But the interesting parts of the, of the structure are the cargo mill planes. So in both cases, you have cargo mill planes. And you see the magnetic moments have a different orientation with respect to each other. So we distinguish them in positive vector spin chirality and negative vector spin chirality systems. So now um, there have been theoretical predictions and also already measurements on these systems that they show a very large anomalous Hall effect. 
Usually people thought that the anomalous Hall effect is proportional to the magne uh, magnetic moment of the ferromagnetic material. And people thought that anti-ferromagnetic systems would not have an anomalous Hall effect. Here, calculations have been demonstrating that the anomalous Hall resistance is large. Also, the resulting magnetization is zero. So we wanted to understand this phenomenon. And we started again with a very similar Hamiltonian as before for the skirmions, same Hamiltonian. And uh, we consider this Kagome system with Hans Ruhl coupling to the, mang to the manganese moments. And uh, the system has a certain symmetry. So uh, we have mirror planes in the system and a combination of time reversal symmetry with the certain mirror planes uh, is a symmetry in the system. Now I add another term, spin orbit coupling, which breaks inversion symmetry. And with broken inversion symmetry, so uh, maybe I should go back with this time reversal and mirror symmetry, the system would not have a, an anomalous Hall effect, since the anomalous Hall effect would be forbidden by symmetry. But if I break inversion symmetry, then my system could have an anomalous Hall effect in principle. But we do not understand why this anomalous Hall effect is large. We understand that it may exist, but we do not understand why it is large since we don't have an, an resulting magnetic moment. So we calculated the band structure. First, we calculated the band structure of this manganese 3 iridium uh, without spin orbit interaction. And you see, we have six bands and we calculated the anomalous Hall conductivity and we get the black line and it's zero everywhere. So, by symmetry, it's forbidden. We don't have an anomalous Hall effect. Now, we switch on spin orbit interaction. We see what happens is that the degeneracies that we have in the uh, system uh, without spin orbit interaction are lifted. And we observe avoided crossing in our calculation. And as a consequence, we also uh, calculate a finite anomalous Hall conductivity. If we have a global gap, we even calculate a quantized anomalous Hall conductivity. Here it's minus two e square over h. How can we understand that? So we first understood that by symmetry, the reasons it would be allowed to have an anomalous Hall effect. But nevertheless, we still don't have this rule of sum that the anomalous Hall effect is proportional to the, to the resulting magnetization. For this reason, we did the following. We take this system with the radial spin texture. We call this is our, is at an angle of 90 degree. And then we tilt the moments out of the plane. This is our radial spin texture, and then we tilt either above or below uh, this plane. And let's have a look at the calculation without spin orbit coupling. You see, we expected, uh, or what we have seen before, let's just concentrate to one energy. Let's just concentrate to the black curve here. For our radial configuration, because of symmetry reasons, the anomalous Hall effect is zero. As soon as I, as I have a certain out of plane tilting, I observe a finite anomalous Hall effect, either here or here, which is now related to the tilting of the magnetic moments. And this is very similar to the skirmion. This is very similar to uh, this tilting angle that you have of the skirmions 
now you have an opening angle of the magnetic moments that give rise to a topological Hall effect. So the Hall effect that you calculate is more a topological Hall effect by this tilting than the anomalous Hall effect that we have calculated before. But this is not yet the end of the story. So we discussed this point. Now we switch on spin orbit interaction. What happens? With spin orbit interaction for the radial configuration, as seen before, we have a finite value, a large value of the uh, whole conductivity. But if we look at the whole motif, or the whole set of curves, it looks like that this zero is shifted to a certain angle, out of plane angle of my, uh, it's 103 degree in this system with these parameters. What does it mean? For this reason, we take our Hamiltonian, we start from the coplanar spin texture, and we do a transformation uh, of our Hamiltonian. A unitary, uh, we do unitary transformations of our Hamiltonian. So we have certain uh, creation and annihilation operators before, we have a certain spin texture and we have this uh, spin orbit interaction with a certain spin orbit interaction constant. After the transformation, we have still the three terms, but we have other operators. We have another spin texture, which we have now a spin texture with M tilde. And we also have a different uh, spin orbit interaction constant. Also the uh, bandwidth changes a little bit. So let's concentrate to the spin texture. What we observe is after the transformation, a tilted, a virtual spin texture. So it looks like that you have um, with uh, this, after the unitary transformation of my Hamiltonian, we have not anymore the radial configuration we started with, but we have a virtual. Although we did the transformation for the, for the radial configuration, the red arrows are tilted. And so it means that uh, the anomalous Hall effect is caused not by the black arrows as we thought, but with spin orbit interaction, it's caused by the red, by the virtuous spin texture and gives rise to a finite value. So it's again, as discussed before, a finite value because it's kind of a topological Hall effect since you have now an opening angle and also a resulting mag magnetization in your system. But there is also something else. As I said before, the whole, set of curves is kind of shifted. And what you also see is an effective spin orbit coupling. And this can be, you can really calculate this. And in particular, the effective spin orbit coupling can become zero again, which is this point. The effective spin orbit coupling is going to be zero at this certain angle, which means that the symmetry is again restored. I have again my old symmetry restored, which means that the virtual spin texture also tilted to an angle of 103 degree, the original spin texture did tilted, but the virtual spin texture is now radial and I don't have spin orbit interaction. So this means uh, that uh, I have now restored the symmetry and by symmetry, the anomalous Hall effect is forbidden. So and this is the end, I think the end of my talk. So I would, uh, I wanted to show you with this second part of my talk or with this last little bit that the anomalous Hall effect in this Kagome antiferromagnets is more a topological Hall effect than the anomalous Hall effect in a ferromagnet as was discussed before. And uh, yeah, this is my main result. And with this, for this topological Hall effect, 
the virtual spin texture is responsible for the whole effect. And then you also have an out of plane magnetization given by the virtual spin texture. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the end of my talk. And let's, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Ingrid. This was a very beautiful talk and, uh, and uh, very clear. Um, so we open it up for the discussion and uh, um, we have uh, um, questions in the question and answers. Uh, maybe if Patrick could uh, unmute uh, Raymond, uh, Christopher Amador, so he can ask uh, directly live his questions uh, to Ingrid. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, I just have um, uh, well two questions now uh, with the close of your of your presentation. Um, so the first uh, re uh, refers to um, the slide on uh, free electrons in a triangular lattice. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering. Um, so you have this Hamiltonian where you have the charge minus the um, the coupling with the vector potential. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you used the um, if you used the dipole approximation for this Hamiltonian term, and if you do, um, would there be an expected change in the placement of the Lando levels that you uh, that you calculate? No, actually, uh, the, it, uh, it's not. Uh, just, uh, it's a, a simple calculation. I just go back to this slide. I think you are asking for this. Yes, slide. exactly. So it's a very simple um, analogy that we try to do. We take, it's not with dipole uh, interaction. We just take uh, the electrons uh, and this, it's similar to my um, skirmion band structure. These are spinless electrons. So uh, spinless electrons in this certain emergent field. So we, we take the emergent field from the skirmions and transfer, transform it into a vector potential. And then it's like you do calculation that you do in quantum mechanics with a certain vector potential you calculate. Right, okay. It's very simple. But nevertheless, okay. uh, the correspondence is surprising. The correspondence between the different, uh, different systems. Um, and if I if I may, I would like to ask a second question about your your uh, second to last slide. Um, so you mentioned that there's this restorative angle about of about 103 degrees, yeah. whereby the symmetries. So I was wondering, um, could one um, kind of extrapolate um, res restorative angle as a function of? So here you're doing calculations on a triangular lattice. Would could one, in theory, at least um, uh, set up a workflow whereby one tries to calculate this res restoration angle as a function of lattice points? Oh, wait a moment. Maybe this I uh, do not understand. First of all, I have to say it's a model system. Okay. And it's just one type of electrons that we use. So, uh, and uh, this restorative angle, of course, depends on uh, the certain parameters of your electronic system. The, hop uh, the hopping uh, uh, constant and uh, also the n. So if you would do a DFT calculation where you have uh, electrons with different symmetry character, then I would say each type of electrons, let's say each electron which belongs to a certain orbital would have a different angle would give rise to a different angle. So it's just a, a simplified picture that gives some microscopic insight. But I, um, I was thinking of this, you cannot, it's difficult to generalize it to a more complex system in the sense that you have more dense electrons with different orbital character. This would be, since then each, electron would have a different angle, by my opinion. Does that answer the question or didn't, I did not get the question 
what did you mean with in real space? Yeah. Uh, you, you did answer the question, yes. Um, that was uh, I, in, the, in the sense that it, it it kind of provoked my curiosity to kind of read a, a little bit more into this because uh, I think this is very interesting. So, yeah. But um, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Kun Young. Uh, exactly, I think Patrick is uh, unmuting. Please go ahead. Okay, hello. Thank you for this great talk. So actually I have a very basic question. So uh, I know for long linear antiferromagnetic systems. So could you explain about how to break the symmetry to get the long zero alumnus hole conductivity. So. No, the, um, I mean, I think I've tried to uh, uh, explain that to you. Let's go once. Yes, more. thank you. Mm -hmm. So this system without spin orbit interaction, if you just have this arrangement of magnetic moments in a, uh, Kagome lattice, you would have a, com a combined time reversal uh, and uh, mirror symmetry. These are the mirror planes that you see here. Yes. Um, I, I would like to mention this is a symmetry like uh, you have uh, combined a time reversal and inversion symmetry for, uh, for metals, for example. And this gives rise to the Gramas degeneracy. The time, this mm -hmm. symmetry would not give rise to a Gramas degeneracy. My bands are not degenerate since the square of these uh, symmetry operators is not minus one, but plus one. So the, the um, eigenvalue that expect from the square of these operators is uh, plus one and not minus one. So no Gramas degeneracy. But we have this symmetry and we have inversion symmetry in the system. But if we switch on spin orbit interaction, then mm -hmm. uh, this special form of spin orbit interaction uh, breaks inversion symmetry since you have this vectors uh, between nearest neighbors. You see the vectors are given here. These are the black arrows. And with these vectors, you introduce a chirality in your system. And this is exactly the same what was done in Haldane's model. It's also exactly the same that you get from jaloszynski moria interaction terms. So this term breaks inversion symmetry. And with broken inversion symmetry, you can have, by symmetry reasons, an anomalous Hall effect. And okay. I tried, so, the calculations, of course, show that as well, that with this term, you get anomalous Hall effect. That's what I wanted to have shown you. And I wanted to illustrate what is then the undergoing mechanism that leads to this uh, anomalous Hall effect. And then my explanation is that this term causes kind of an out of plane tilting of the texture. And the out of plane tilting then is. Uh, related to a resulting magnetic moment and so or a resulting magnetization and then you have or to an opening angle which is the same that you calculate in the topological hall effect does that answer your question yes it is yes it's exactly uh, answer my question thank you but uh, i mean for most of the uh, for example, for the magnetic materials, if they have a very small and anisotropic magnetic energy, so this means you can uh, tune its magnetic uh, directions, right? So it will break the symmetry. Maybe yeah. you can also get the alumnus hall effect. Um, uh, you are right that you can break the symmetry by a magnetic anisotropy. Mm -hmm. But this, um, uh, the magnetic anisotropy energy is small in comparison to uh, the exchange energy that you have for this non-collinear arrangement in your sample. So you can break it and you would get a small resulting uh, moment. 
But this small resulting moment would not be large enough to explain the large anomalous hole conductivities that you calculate and measure in these systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kun. And uh, then uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Raffaele Resta, if uh, Patrick can. Oh. Hi, Raffaele. Okay, do you hear me? Very yes. well. Yeah, I sent the message in a question and answer, but was not answered. It's very simple. Do you have any any anything more to say about the gigantic chair numbers? Is there anything I've met them before, but always they, they I could not make any rationale of why they should be there, why, why they're so big. You mean uh, no, I I in which respect I don't understand where do they occur, not in relation to the transport properties. No, no, just just the, the, the plot you have shown with 24 in the quantum mole ah, effect. This one. Ah, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, I understand. 24 what you... in the quantum mole effect, yeah, right? This... 24. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. This is very, um, yeah, I can show uh, the figure again. Yeah. This is, uh, I have been thinking about this phenomenon for I a long also. time. <laughs> and the point is, so the very curvature, as you know, you know very well, of course, is yeah. related to the curvature of the bands. And this is a very certain band. So this band is, uh, I mean, uh, not in, in my calculation, oh, wait a moment, I go, uh, I go to this, yeah. Sorry, but I bother you. No, okay. Let's go back to this. This, uh, this means this is a very flat band with many wrinkles. And all what, what happens, what I observed, is that all the uh, band or all the, the edge states, they attached, you see it here nicely what I want to say. Yeah. So these bands are uh -huh. not re really flat. They have very many maxima and minima, as many as the term number, and all the edge states, they attach coming from above or below, they attach to this band at the Van Hofer singularity. And it's also a very, if you think in cyclotron orbits, it's also a very special cyclot cyclotron orbit. So uh, it looks like it's very extended since it has this, uh, if you go to the, if you go to the orbit here, it's this very, this orbit is not circular. It's more than has these flat branches. So uh, yeah, I don't have a clear explanation, but I know this, that the underlying band has lots of uh, curvatures. So lots of maxima and minima and that all edge states attach to this certain band at the Van Hofer singularity. Since the fun, so, this is a band that changes the curvature in general. So, yeah. and uh, all the edge modes change also character since from above, I have only right movers and from below, I have only left movers. So here, yeah, you see that uh, the, the velocity is also opposite. So it changes the, the Van Hofer singularity and this flat band uh, separates between electron and holds the uh, orbits. And so also for the edge states. This would also above, did, this would be whole edge modes and this would be electron edge modes. I, I had the impression that was much more general because you'll find them even in a two-band model. Now maybe even a two-band model, if you think in terms of a finer system with edges, your your reasoning can be can be reconciled. So in, I I found them even in a very simple square lattice with only one band. With one in, band. lattice with one band, it has a Van Hove singularity just in the middle of the band. Yeah, and, but uh, always at the Van Hove singularity, right? It's a Van Hove singularity, of yeah. course. And this is related that the character at the Van Hove singularity, the character of the bands changes 
of the, of yeah, the orbit. This is a, a, that is a single band, but the, the character of occupy states changes in the yeah, from is, electron is to true. hole. Is true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, and also the character of the edge mode edge modes yeah. changes. So this means otherwise all the edge modes are behind the whole band structure. Yeah. <clears throat> but if you have a Van Hofe singularity, the edge modes have to end. And they end at this certain band at the Van Hofe singularity. Okay, thank you. The, the, if my, I, may, I would have a completely different question. That is when you have an antiferromagnet, you, you say that the spin magnetization is zero. Yeah. Is, is that guaranteed that even the orbital magnetization is zero in such system, always? No, actually, this is a very interesting question. I uh, can even show you the spin magnetization was calculated in my band structures. I didn't discuss it, but it was in this picture. Here you see the spin magnetization, the color on the yeah. bands is the out of band spin magnetization. <laughs> but the point is, the spin magnetization is really tiny, is so small that it cannot explain the large anomalous Hall effect that is uh, calculated and measured. So um, the orbital magnetization for these systems, we are, this is ongoing work. We are going to calculate it and uh, yeah, there might be a large orbital moment, but I cannot show you the results yet. So it's thank you, very interesting. I will be interested if you, if you find it big, okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is a kind of a new field. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you could calculate with the spin, you yeah. can also do with the orbital moment. Yeah. And now you have to find uh, some, um, I, in the beginning of my talk, I said that there are no terminals that measure a spin current, but there are even no terminals that measure an orbital current. So it's a kind of a, an interesting question. How can I really show, I have to convert, if there are orbital currents, I have to convert them finally to a charge current to measure them. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Raffaele. And uh, we have a question from uh, JMO Lima. You can unmute yourself and ask, please. Yeah, thank you for the talk. So my question is, in this part, in this part, you talk about the special signal recoupling. So what is the origin of that signal recoupling? So you mentioned the jolosinski moria interaction, but this is an electronic Hamiltonian, not magnetic Hamiltonian. So I was a bit oh, confused. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it, it is jaloszynski moria interaction. I said that the structure of this term, this, this, um, the, this, spin, so you have different ways to model spin orbit interaction. You probably know Rashba spin orbit interaction for electrons in a solid. This is, uh, another type of spin orbit interaction, which is um, a site dependent spin orbit interaction, but there is some uh, interaction between neighboring sites. So these are next nearest neighbors. And then you have these vectors connecting next nearest neighbors. And they have a certain uh, direction. And you see uh, with this, term, you introduce, you break inversion symmetry. That's the most important thing. And you introduce a chirality in your system. Since now the electron knows whether it goes this way or it goes the other way around. And uh, I only said this, that this is very similar to the structure of chaloszynski moria interaction. If you, uh, so the, the jaloszynski moria interaction constant that you have in front of the gross product of two magnetic moments, which I did not consider, has as well this uh, combination of next nearest neighbors. That's what I wanted to say. It's also jaloszynski moria interaction.
does as well break inversion symmetry. That's what I wanted to say. If I, if I can um, well, make my question clear. So if you do density function, for example, if you do density functional theory, then you will only have uh, atomic spin orbit coupling. So uh, my question is how does this this new kind of spin recoupling emerges from that atomic spin recoupling. Yeah, I would answer the other way around. If you really do, if you really solve Dirac equation within density functional theory, you have all kinds of, all types of, like you have Rashba and you have this type of spin orbit interaction included. It's only that in a model Hamiltonian, you can, uh, concentrate to one of these terms. Either you do a Rashba analysis or a Dresselhaus analysis, or you do a Haldane model, or you do uh, this term. But uh, in a full calculation, everything is in. You cannot distinguish anymore be between the, dif uh, the different contributions of the different types of spin orbit interaction. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Cemo. And uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Babu Prasad. Uh, and yeah, please go ahead. Um, okay, yeah, thank you, Professor Martin, for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the Berry curvature part. So, as you mentioned, like uh, when you compute the Berry curvature, we take the contribution from all other bands. Yeah. So, I'm wondering because you have a denominator with the energy difference for the different bands. Yeah. So what happens when you consider the case for the degenerate bands? No, this is excluded. Uh, uh, since it's excluded, I go back to my expression. Mm. Let's go here. Oh, this is spin variable. Let's here. So it's excluded by M unequal N. So um, degeneracies are, you, uh, the whole Berry curvature concept is a semi-classical concept. And it means that you consider the motion of your electron in one single band, no interband transitions, uh, just one single band. And the other bands that also occur, they form a force field that acts to the motion of the electron in this single band. I mean, if you do, you can do the same calculation fully quantum mechanically by means of the Kubo formula. Then everything is in, then you integrate also, you also have interband transitions in, you don't, do not need a Berry curvature. It's just a replacement for interband transitions, or the, 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 I wouldn't say interband transitions, I would say it's a replacement for the influence of other bands to the one you selected. Okay, I got it. Uh, I have a second question regarding your slide about when you compare this pre-electron like uh, energy bands with the skirmion. Mm -hmm. uh, I just... Skir you mean the, the one for the free electrons and the skirmion? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, like the yeah. one slides comparing these two. Yeah, yeah, wait a moment, I'm just there. Sure, 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 sure. thank you. Okay. The slides are very tiny on my, but I hope it's... Uh, it's, it's clear yeah, to me, it's pretty clear, clear to me. Uh, here? Uh, maybe, maybe the next one with the conductivity as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. this one. I think this one is much better, yeah, the, the final slides. So here I noticed one is more, I don't know if I'm missing something else. Like, now, just below the minus 902, um, just below that, uh, I can see a like positive conductivity on the left hand side. You, you, have, you see uh, this jump, this pronounced jump. You also see the second jump. But then, because what I mentioned before, there is a bulk band in between which suppresses the jump. And you have to imagine like this. I discussed. Uh, the, the regular Hall conductivity and the quantized Hall conductivity. And you have to imagine that the edge states have a certain way of circulating in your sample. 
and the uh, bulk electrons, they have their orbital motion in opposite direction. So uh, the, Hall, the, the Hall conductivity from the edge states and the Hall conductivity from the bulk bands has opposite sign. And what you have, you, you would have here a plateau of two, which would correspond, uh, of four, which would correspond to this. But you see that you have a strong hybridization with this bulk band. And the bulk band itself is also not very wide. So you have really a strong suppression here. Do you see that? Yes, 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 yes I can see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I think, I, think, I think that answers my question. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor, for the nice explanation. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, thank you, Babu. Um, I guess uh, maybe I have uh, a question with my material scientist hat on, that is, uh, you know, this entire field, uh, has given us, uh, you know, wonderful physics and wonderful science, as you have shown us today. I mean, broadly speaking, it has also given us, uh, uh, you know, great uh, technologies, after all, uh, you know, the tunneling magnetoresistance, the giant magnetoresistance yeah. have been at the basis uh, of, you know, revolution in data storage. Do you, do you have any feeling uh, if uh, some of this uh, more novel properties uh, could actually see some technological application in the future, I think. Uh, what is the feeling in the magnetic and topological community for uh, applications in devices? Um, for the topological properties, um, I would say this is still complicated since, so as you know, you really would need a good insulator. Yeah. And so, this by the environment, it should stay an insulator. Yeah. And the topological insulators itself, they don't have such a large gap that they stay a good insulator Wait. under certain uh, conditions. Yeah. For the skirmions, of course, the skirmions are nice objects uh, that can be used as bits. For example, in the racetrack memory that was proposed by Albert Pert himself, and I think that people are working in this direction. The skirmions itself have a disadvantage that they do not move a straight in the racetrack, but they have the skirmion hall effect, which means that the uh, skirmion is, if you start with a straight motion, then it it turns to left or right and is destroyed at the at the edges of your of your uh, system. This can be reduced, and there are ideas how to. But you can look for other magnetic worlds that do not have the Skirman Hall effect, or the so that do that move straight, and then you would have a good object for a bit. But Something that I think is more of interest, also it's not so, not for giant magneto resistance, the application for memory devices were instantaneous. And after eight years, every hard disk drive had the GMR reading head. So, I, but I think the spin currents are very interesting. And even the orbital currents, if we, learn more about orbital currents, then this is a current that doesn't have true heating. Spin currents and orbital currents, they you can transport, yeah. but you don't have true heating. But of course, as I mentioned also already in the talk, you have to um, convert it back to charge current to, uh, to bring it to a device. You can use it for transfer, but uh, at the end, you have to uh, convert it into a charge current. This is, but I think for the future, this is an interesting option since uh, it would save a lot of energy. No, thank you. Very, very, very fascinating. Um, I think uh, with this, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone that has been uh, attending. Uh, remind you of the SECAM Marvel Classics uh, next uh, week's uh, next week uh, with Tatanos Panagiotopoulos and Dominic Tildesley 
in January, many body perturbation theory, Lucia Ryan, Enger, X. Godby, and Steve Louis. Uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, uh, more distinguished lectures uh, with Sharon Glotzer, Alana Spurovudzik, and Garnet Chan in the spring. And uh, Ingrid, uh, it was a real pleasure uh, seeing you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, still uh, all uh, virtual. Maybe, you know, we'll start again uh, next summer, who knows. Uh, but in the meanwhile, a big thank uh, from uh, me and uh, from everyone attending. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so much for the invitation and oh, for the interesting you. discussion. Great, great pleasure. And bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you.